Perfect. Okay. Welcome to this uh, module two, which is uh, uh, information system assurance services. Uh, this module typically is focused on uh, <coughs> uh, what is the information system all about and how do you as an auditor render an assurance service, which is basically in simple language, IS audit. Okay. So the entire focus of this chapter is on the concepts of IS audit. So again, here, uh, uh, the initial part of it um, is all about what is audit, etc. So let me quickly spend some time and not take too much time onto it. Uh, we all know it's an independent uh, examination of data uh, statement records. And in the case of IS audit, it is expressing an opinion on the information system or on the ERP, on the application, or whatever is the scope intended. So the fact that we are expressing an opinion continues to be as it is. Okay, uh, this recording, I'll try my best what we can do because uh, there are some challenges and constraints as well. Let me see best what is possible. Uh, but uh, I suggest hanging on until the end of the session. Uh, uh, coming back to the uh, content. Uh, so as far as this audit session or, or the concept is concerned, it is expressing an opinion on the underlying uh, information asset. It could be IS asset, it could be an ERP, it could be an application, whatever you may call it. And as an IS auditor, you perceive and recognize the propositions before you so that you are able to collect evidence, evaluate, and then you take a judgment. And here it could be true and fair. It could be the way in which the system works. Anything and everything could fall within this meaning of the audit. Okay, now here, let's also understand in a financial audit, the focus is on the financial information to express an opinion. In an IS audit also, the expression of opinion is there, but it's an independent review and it is the evaluation of the controls and the information systems. It can also be related manual systems and interfaces. Please be aware of that. It can be the entire thing on the technology environment. See, in a financial audit, the scope is given under the law, which is the law, Income Tax Act. It could be your uh, statutory uh, uh, companies act. It could be, let us say, RBI regulations. Whereas when it comes to IS audit, it is defined based on the understanding between the client and the auditor. So where, when an IS audit is done, IS audit can be done internally. As a part of you know some internal audit, they just want to evaluate some controls. Sometimes done by the management or on behalf of the management. Why you want to prove some quality, you want to prove some external stakeholders. There is somebody who is like, you know, um, uh, a new vendor is asking, hey, how secure are your operations? So they may come and ask. Or it could be an independent external audit exercise. For example, if you're a banking entity, if you are a uh, insurance industry, all these entities are subject to regular review. All these entities are subject to periodical checks and balances, uh, you know, from an independent or an external auditor. And the last could be, it could be performed by an independent external party. I repeat, it could be done by an independent external party. Now this could be, please note, it's an independent external party by mandated itself by the uh, regulators or by some sort of a due diligence, etc. Uh, sometimes even the financial auditor may do an IS audit to get an assurance or a comfort level of the internal controls. So for all these purposes, my dear friends, let us be aware that IS audit is done. So what are the classification of audits? Now you can classify these audits as compliance audits. Why you are doing an IS audit merely for the purpose of compliance. Example, RBI says get an audit. Uh, there is something called as a payment card industry, PCL. All those people who are processing credit card information, debit card information should compulsory be subject to this PCI. Of course, there's a threshold, etc. If you're doing one or two transactions, it's not mandatory. Then you have financial audits. Now, this financial audits, they assess the accuracy of the financial information, whether my ERP, the procurement controls are solid, whether the segregation of duties are well established, it could be a core banking software, etc. Then you have operational audits, this could be day to day exercise, review of fair access, 
who has access, whether access is terminated on the right time. You know, these are periodical exercises. Then you can do an integrated. You do financial, you do operational, you combine both of them, combination of external, internal, etc. Then you may also do administrative office just to evaluate the efficiency. This is normally done when you want to prove that, you know, how your system was prior and post. The era earlier and the post era. So in those scenarios also, you may consider. Then sometimes you may also do a forensic audit. You know, you might say, sir, forensic audit and IT audit are totally different. I agree. A forensic is more investigation oriented. There may be an element of technology involved. So maybe to some extent, I would still say the IT and the forensic still go hand in glove because you need to understand how the IT environment works if you have to do a forensic audit. Okay. Now, what is an IS audit? IS audit of an IS environment may typically include assessment of internal controls, assess the validity and reliability and security, and it may also focus on efficiency and effectiveness. That is how quick it is, and the effectiveness is more to do with the qualitative parameters. So if you look into the SA 200, the principles of audit still govern here integrity, objectivity, independence, which all of us are aware, skill and competence. And this is where a course such as DISA is recommended. Confidentiality, the details, what you collect. And in fact, in IS audit, you get much more confidential information. Uh, not that in financial, you don't get, you do get it. But here, when you get a confidential information, you get the confidential information, how the network is structured, how the infrastructure is. So if accidentally somebody tries to break into it, it is a risky thing. Then you also try to see whether can I rely upon work performed by others. This is a very important thing. Why? See, practically speaking, the entire IS audit cannot be done by one person. You may want to actually refer some other small bits and pieces for, to an expert. For example, there is something called penetration testing. Now, what is a penetration testing or a vulnerability testing? Identifying the weaknesses within the system by, you know, logically pinging each of those resources or sending the IP or, you know, sending the uh, messages and see whether a external hacker can actually attack external or internal, whoever it is, can they attack the system? Now, what this will bring is, it will bring a good safeguard. And when I use the word good safeguard, it will ensure that, come what may, if I am able to attack and identify the weakness on my own. It is better than a external hacker coming and attacking. So those sort of people are called as vulnerability and penetration experts, whom we popularly call as ethical hackers. So those are work performed by others. Then you have documentation. And when you use the word documentation, here we are referring to what is the information which is available? How am I tracking them? How am I keeping a copy of it? Your SOPs, your agreements, etc. Then, of course, you have your accounting system, internal controls, which you have to look into. When you look into internal controls, here you're focusing on the IT controls. And last is your audit conclusion and reporting. Okay, so these are all the principles of SC200, which is spoken. And when you try to look into a computerized environment, you need to move from the traditional wall approach to e wall approach. Here, E means electronic. Okay, so traditionally audit was conducted manually, but today it is all run through systems. Here, important examination question. It is done through three methods, auditing through the computer, auditing around the computer, gray box testing, white box, gray box, and black box. White box is what is called as auditing through the computer. That means you are looking around. You are not, uh, sorry, you are, uh, you are looking the processing logic. In the white box, you look into the processing logic. That means you forget the input, you forget the output. You focus only on the process. Auditing around the computer means you look into the input, you look into the output. You are not bothered about the processing because when you look into the process, uh, when you look into the output, indirectly the impact of processing is taken care of. 70 to 80% of the times, audit is all done on a black box approach, where we look only at the input and output. We don't look into the processing. Now you might say, sir, if you do, don't look into the processing, don't you think we are defeating the purpose? I would not say to a large extent. Why? Because the output, you are reviewing it. So you know how the system is behaving, correct? So how do I remember this? Remember, 
all of you in our uh, school we have heard this concept called black hole you know where light also is not able to penetrate very very dark we don't know whether if something is there beyond that etc in the solar system or whatever the galaxy unit universe whatever you can call it so in the black box we cannot see what is inside we can only see what is outside so when we do an audit of outside which is input and processing it is called as audit around the computer whereas if you look into processing logic which is basically inside there is a white box a gray box is a combination of both remember whenever you do an audit the stronger the internal controls are the lesser time you spend in detailed audit if the internal controls are very very strong your sampling procedure also will be very limited it will change okay let me remind you here lot of questions on sampling also asked in exam concept of risk which is very important for us to understand okay correct so risk is given under various buckets we call it as enterprise risk you have what is called as a strategic risk strategic risk is the risk that your business is going in a different strategy altogether for instance today you decided that you want to sell a different type of a product whatever may be the type of product but that product today people are up are you know uh, deciding to buy only in the online mode and not on the uh, uh, you know the physical mode so your strategy itself goes wrong environmental risk for example this bs4 compliant vehicles marketing risk you are launching a product without understanding the market what the expectation is credit risk huge risk today you are selling all the products on credit not expecting or not knowing when you'll get back the money your operational risk day to day whether your backup is taken whether your uh, you know sweeper comes and cleans the place whether uh, you know the server rooms are kept clean all of this compliance compliance with the laws and regulations you know it could be to, uh, india is coming up with what is called as a personal data Uh, uh, act very so it's called as it's a, it's still a bill even a budget session is expected to be approved and it becomes a personal data act so how are we going to protect the individual data throughout this entire risk which i just spoke we have the it risk in fact let me tell you today this it of course this out of syllabus let me tell you this it risk itself is breaking into i risk and t risk why the risk with respect to information is different the risk with respect to technology is different so today it is no longer called as it it is called as i and t why information has a unique types of risk whereas technology has got another unique types of risk but be that as it may from a understanding perspective we will restrict it to it risk now we need to keep in mind more the failure of it heavier is the impact on business i repeat more the failure of it heavier is the impact of the business so there is something which you have to be careful now what is the risk risk is the likelihood please understand these wordings are very important exam examination asked question because they ask you the entire flow of risk L risk is the likelihood an organization would face a vulnerability being exploited i repeat it likelihood means probability organization client you me any company vulnerability inherent weakness exploited somebody actually makes use of it or sort of exploits it so what is risk a likelihood that is probability that the organization whichever we are auditing would have a inherent weakness which is exploited by somebody okay and this is basically caused because of the gap between the need to protect versus the actual protection okay and this has become a very very globally growing concept everybody is risk averse if they want to be very very careful now on the fun side will my client give me the fees after i render the service it's a simple risk it may fall under any of those risks but it's a risk now sources of risk this could be because of commercial and legal relationship you have entered into a contract by virtue of the contract you are supposed to safeguard the data you are entered into recently i think uh, uh, which is this big uh, big basket big basket all their information was uh, 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 recently hacked correct the, all their information became public now they are bound to notify all those people so commercial and legal relationship economic circumstances uh, most of the pharma companies 
today are subject to heavy uh, attacks from hackers why because they know pharma companies are where the money is for the next 2 to 3 years because they're spending so much time in research marketing uh, you know medicine and attention is slowly moving towards the medical sector so which means they have money they have a lot of confidential information and more importantly many of them today in india or across the world are losing their jobs so economic circumstances human behavior we don't know how a person will behave at one given point in time today may behave in one method tomorrow he may behave in a different method natural events events which are outside our control you know earthquake tsunami floods political circumstances you know in fact many of them argue that you know elections sometimes are rigged you know those things are issues there technology and technical issues windows 7 is no longer supported by microsoft windows 8 8.1 and windows 10 is only supported by them so if you still have a windows 7 it has a vulnerability microsoft is not going to fix that correct management of activities individual activities all of them are becomes a sources of risk what is the related terminology i told you vulnerability the weakness in the system okay basically arises due to flaws in the system inherent weaknesses etc leaving a door open in the night unwanted visitors will come if you have the password as 1 2 3 anybody can guess it correct second threat threat is an external event okay an external action event or condition where there is a compromise on the quality i repeat there is a compromise on the quality and it is prevented by applying some sort of a protection destruction uh, it could be a destruction of computer system denial of service attack what is a denial of service you are trying to access a website but the website is not available why maybe too much of traffic or somebody is hacked that website and they says you are no longer available you are trying to enter your own home or office or you are you want to access your own data but that fellow says pay me some money only then allow you to access the data run somewhere all these things are threats then comes exposure the extent of loss the organization has to face when the risk has been materialized what is the extent of loss you know it can normally have a long term impact it could be lo- business loss reputation etc an exposure could be you know 2 uh, million records leaked what is the possible legal phase legal tussles legal issues which it has to face the likelihood i told you it's a probability an asset asset is anything valuable to uh, sorry attack sorry yeah attack an attempt to uh, compromise the cia anything which does to compromise the cia what is cia confidentiality integrity available so any sort of an attempt to compromise this becomes a attack counter measure counter measure is an action device or a procedure which you keep in mind to reduce a vulnerability okay anything which you do to reduce a vulnerability example what is the counter measure for spoofing user identity you create a otp you create a strong password biometric so i know that whoever is logging into my system is authenticated now let me tell you my dear friends this entire chapter focus heavily on the risk so you should understand the technology what we read in the first chapter and the second chapter focus on risk and how you audit which is the core part of it because as an auditor you are expected to understand the it risks in a clear understandable manner because only if you have the knowledge of it risk my dear friends you can actually understand how to audit it residual risk very 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 important examination question residual risk acceptable risk next to two three slides will cover that residual risk acceptable risk very important first whenever we have a risk okay we apply some control to mitigate it but even after the control is kept some risk will still be left over that is called residual risk i repeat my question you have a risk you put in a control despite you having a control some risk will still be left over that is called residual risk example unauthorized entry is a risk what did you do you kept a security guard 24 hours one shift other but can the security guard probably fall asleep can the security guard go to attend nature call 2 to 3 minutes somebody is not there when 2 to 3 minutes somebody is not there what happens attack can happen now that is the residual risk 
Now that also you don't want. Keep two, two, two security guards. Now what if both the security guards are sleeping? Agree? Or worst comes in area. What if the perpetrator was so very strong he shot down both the security guards and still happened? Which means risk will always be there. If you want to avoid enter risk, bring one battalion and army also. Who knows what if there was an atomic bomb? Everybody dies. That means the risk will always be there. To what extent you are reducing, that is based upon the amount and the resources which you can afford. And the controls are kept to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. The risk which is available for you to accept is called acceptable risk. Okay, we'll come to it a little later, acceptable risk. So basically you ensure that my residual risk is fairly low. So you, you are, how will you decide whether my risk can be acceptable or not? It is based upon my acceptance of residual risk and the selection of safeguards. Remember, residual risk should always be kept at a minimal or an acceptable. Okay, these are a few risk management strategies which all of us are aware, aware, avoid. Do not take chances at all. You know, don't, for example, Windows 7 is outdated. The only thing which I can do now is just to avoid it. Nothing I can do. What do I do to avoid? Upgrade, move to the next technology, move to a more robust one, go to Windows 8.1, go to Windows 10. Next, transfer or share the risk. This is where you sort of enter into a insurance company. You outsource that risk. You know, all these possibilities are there. You share or transfer the risk. So you give it to somebody else. The third thing is you accept the risk. Why? You feel it is very, very minor. Why? If you have to deploy the control, the control is more expensive than the asset itself. You know, the asset value is probably about 10,000 to 50,000. If I keep a security guard and security measures, I have to spend about 2 lakhs to 3 lakhs. Not worth it. Wherever it is, risk is minor, you accept the risk. And remember very, very carefully, a risk which you accept without any controls is called acceptable risk. The risk which is left over after you keep the controls is called residual risk. Residual risk and acceptable risk are very, very popular examination questions. Okay, so that is very, very critical. Okay, now you, you can always ask, sir, from an IT perspective, how do you share the risk? How do you transfer the risk? Let me give an example. Today, assuming an organization having sensitive data, let us say healthcare data, let us say credit card information, bank information. Now, these organizations may have entered into an SLA with a data center operator and told that fellow boss, data is mine, you have to protect it. Data is mine, I will save my data in your premises for which I'm paying your fees. Your duty is to only safeguard that data. If an attack happens from my resource, I will take up the responsibility. But despite me safeguarding the data, somebody comes and attacks, you are a headache. So you are entering into a outsourcing arrangement. Shared data centers outsourced. Are you able to get the example of transfer and share risk? One more example of transfer and share the risk is you're taking an insurance, cyber insurance policy. Okay, that is from an IT. Now accept the risk. Accept the risk is where you consider the risk to be minor. It's too small. We just leave it. And last is mitigate the risk. Mitigation of the risk is where you believe that, you know, by using some technique or some method, you can overcome that risk. It's called mitigation of the risk. In the case of a mitigation, you are actually applying the control. Remember, avoid risk, you can totally eliminate it because you are moving with some other better technology. Maybe that new technology also will have small amount of risk. Transfer or share the risk, you are transferring the risk to that person. But again, nothing is 100% risk free. Last is mitigate risk. What is mitigate risk? In the case of mitigate risk, you are deploying a control to solve the problem. In avoid transfer and mitigate, you will still be left with some amount of risk after you follow the strategy. And that is called residual risk.
Clear? And then, of course, last you have the accept, accept risk. Accept risk, accept risk is the risk which you intend to accept even without any control. Okay, then you have what is called as a risk matrix. This again, uh, not very important from examination, more practical oriented. So risk matrix is basically, you can call it as a risk control matrix when it's become very popular, where you define the risk, uh, which is a combination of your uh, uh, impact and uh, uh, your uh, probability. Probability of the risk to occur, certain likely possible or likely rare, one to five. And what is the possible uh, impact of that? Uh, maybe uh, extremely high catastrophic, critical, marginal, negligible, you can define that. Okay, you can put it like this, a uh, small matrix. And if it is extreme and unlikely or whatever, you decide what is the risk treatment strategy. Okay, so you can just decide like this. For example, if the possibility is uh, high and impact is marginal, you mitigate. But if both of them are extreme, okay, what you do, you avoid it. So like this, you can define what should be the risk strategy. This box, whatever you see, nine, three into three, nine, this is your risk strategy. Avoid, transfer, mitigate, accept. I mean, this is just an example. Need not be, this is the thumb rule. Even if it is marginal, some person may decide to uh, transfer. Even if it's catastrophically here also, you may decide to transfer. So this is a basis for you to decide risk. Risk and risk treatment. Okay, so I'm not going into the case studies, etc. Next is your risk universe. Risk universe is the blanket or is the ocean of all the possible risks. All the possible risks will be basically a risk universe. Some of the risks may not be applicable to you. You remove them and therefore you, you come up with a blanket or bucket list saying that, okay, fine. From the risk universe, only this bucket of risk is applicable for me or this carton box of risk is applicable for me. It considers the overall business objective, considers the full life cycle of IT related business programs, investment and the whole bucket of it. Yeah, very important. When we do an IT audit, you do a risk based audit, meaning in the financial audit also we do a risk based audit, but we are slowly evolving. One other day is where we said that, okay, let me go as per my audit checklist plan. Today, what is the highest risk I want to spend more time? Least risk I'm not bothered. So that is why it is called risk based auditing. Adapted to develop and improvise the continuous audit process. It helps to determine and test the nature of extent and testing. And your SA 315 and SA 330 are very good auditing standards. I would highly recommend go through the gist of SA 315 and 330 because you can expect one or two questions from examination. SA 315 says it is the standard for risk identification and assessment. So it says that an IS auditor should assess. I mean, of course, an auditor. Here we have to use from IS angle. So IS auditor should assess the risk that is a part of the business environment and the internal control. SA 330 says the auditor has to evaluate whether management has designed the and implemented the appropriate risk. So please understand 315 and 330 difference. 315, IS auditor has to assess the risk. 330. IES auditor has to assess the risk of the controls deployed or effectiveness of controls deployed by the client for mitigating this. So that's the difference between 315 and 330. So how do you do a risk-based audit? There's a very nice chart where you can get the entire picture. First, gather the information and plan. Get the knowledge of business. Very, very important. Knowledge of the business is the first step. One of the questions they'll ask you, which of the following is the first step followed in the risk-based audit approach? Whatever may be the option, knowledge of the business is the first step. Prior results, inherent risk assessment, regulatory, all those things come later. Okay, this chart is important for you to expect one or two MCQ questions. They can ask you which of the following is first, or they can ask you, arrange the following in chronological order. Arrange the following in chronological order. So that now it becomes it. So knowledge of business, prior year results, inherent risk assessment, regulatory statutory requirements, all those are first. Then you understand the IT environment. How is the IT environment? What are the controls in place? Are they using a ERP? Are they using a tally? Are they using a cloud-based software or are they designing their own cloud-based software? Is it designed by them or used by a third party? Or is that designing activity 
thirty percent done by them, forty percent outsourced. So all of them they have to decide, control procedures, everything. Then detection and control risk assessment. What is the risk or how are those controls operating at? So you understand the entity controls. Then you go into compliance testing and substantive testing. Compliance testing very important is the test of controls. I repeat. compliance testing test of controls you identify which are the controls to be tested example password has to be changed once in 45 days so you go to the it administrator you tell give me the list of users and when was the last time they changed the password last two times when they changed the password he'll give you an entire list so from today's date do minus 45 see any of the date comes there non compliant oh but simple correct so identify the controls to be tested perform test on the reliability risk prevention etc then you have what is called substantive testing where this is where you go into the test of detail test of transaction test of account balances very important compliance and substantive again expect a question and examination between these both in substantive testing you have analytical procedures you have test of account balances transactions all of them come under substantive procedures and last conclusion of the audit what is the conclusion you need to give recommendations you need to give findings you need to give what is the issues correct all of this you need to give and that is when you are able to conclude that obviously audit so this is the flow of a risk based audit approach okay very important slide very 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 important slide audit risk the risk that an auditor may issue a unqualified or a clean report due to failure to detect material misstatements that means there were issues which the auditor failed to notice as a result of which he gave a clean report or an unqualified report that is called as an audit risk audit risk is a combination of these three inherent detection control we need to understand each of them very clearly inherent risk is the risk by default inbuilt risk the very nature of inventory and cash is that it can be stolen the very nature of a username and password is that if the password is weak anybody can hack it correct so inbuilt risk vulnerable to problem cash sales overriding controls by senior management all of those are inherent risk detection risk the risk that the auditor's audit procedure is not able to detect a problem remember detection risk is always associated with substantive procedures i repeat detection risk is always associated with substantive procedures examination asked question risk that an auditor not able to detect error using substantive procedures what is substantive procedures testing of details testing of the transactions this is a very important thing an example could be satyam case whatever next control risk the risk not prevented by the internal controls meaning it is to some extent management actually it is purely not auditor's risk it is purely not auditor it is like some element of management what is the control risk the risk that the management has kept internal controls but despite the controls being in picture the risk is not prevented for example if a security guard is kept and the security guard is sleeping control failure or the security guard is kept but he is regularly disappearing or he colluded with the thief then it all becomes control risk risk not prevented by the internal control is control risk there can be scenarios of people overriding the controls as well all of this can be a audit risk i hope you are clear this is a very important slide from an examination perspective another example in case of a bank following are the inherent risk inbuilt risk vulnerability banks inherent risk is over 
detection risk, risk of auditor not able to detect. Thief accesses another account at a money machine, but it is not detectable. Somebody swiped, he immediately touched this fellow or he said some, uh, your key you forgot to keep or whatever. This fellow runs to the key, this fellow withdraws the money and goes. Detection risk, control risk, you know, where the fraud occurs, but the bank is not able to identify. So some things like this, okay? Yeah, so these are just uh, examples, yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting question, uh, uh, interesting concept. Examination asked, DMZ, demilitarized zone. See, this is a concept where it comes from the army. The area between two nations in which military operation is not permitted. You can, one can also refer to that as, you know, that India, Pakistan or India, China border, where you are, you, you see the enemy, but you're not permitted to shoot. Why? The, he and you, both of them are there for a particular purpose. We can meet, greet, that's all. So DMZ is a conceptual concept from that which came in, where publicly accessible servers are placed in a separate isolated network segment. So whatever publicly can access, they are kept aside from what can be internally accessed. Example, Google is using a huge server. It gives the server for the entire world. It obviously has a service on its own. The Google servers are internalized, which is used for them. The Google servers, which are externalized, are used by the entire world. The intention of DMZ is to ensure publicly accessible server cannot contact the internal networks. You know, if you have to put it in this COVID environment, there's a nice example. A doctor, after he or she comes home, they prefer meeting their family members because of this COVID situation. They say, we will speak at a distance. Why? Because there is a risk that, you know, they may spread the infection. You can consider that line as a DMZ. It separates the land versus the interested networks. Okay, next, types of detection risk. Again, another example. This is again an example. Again, please note, few of them are covered in your material, few of them are not covered. So therefore, I made it very simple and precise so that you're able to answer it easily in the exam. Sampling risk. The risk that the incorrect assumptions are made about the population based upon the sample, meaning, I evaluated three controls out of 25, uh, uh, 25 uh, 500 was the population, 25 was my sample, three controls were a failure. Therefore, I can conclude three by 25. That means one eighth is wrong or one eighth is fraud. Or if I say one eighth, that means, uh, you know, I can probably also argue you know, in a, in a span of, you know, 360 days, 360 divided by eight, whatever the equivalent number, that many days there is an error. That may or may not be the truth, correct? That is a sampling risk. Example, sample chosen is perfect, reverse scenario. Sample chosen is perfect, but the entire population is incorrect. This is a by default, and please note, this is a variant of detection risk. Remember, audit risk has three components, inherent risk, detection risk, control risk. Inherent risk, normally, because of the underlying asset. It could be a phone, it could be a mouse, because of the underlying asset. Detection risk, only that of an auditor. Control risk is mostly from a management angle, whether the control is effective or not, auditor tries to verify it. Under detection risk, two categories, sampling risk, non-sampling risk. Non-sampling risk are totally incorrect. I mean, sorry, totally uh, unrelated to this. You know, it is not relating to sample. Maybe human design or human error, the way I took the sample, I saw that if the evidence was failure or, you know, the evidence is not there or it is a risk, but I still said, okay, fine. In the case of Satyam, non-sampling risk also took place. Why? That fellow knew it was a fraud. He said, okay, fine, no problem, you do it. Correct? Where the compromise of ethics, integrity, all those things. Yeah. These are questions I don't want to spend too much time. Materiality. Materiality means importance of the information to the users. I repeat, importance of the information to the users. It is totally auditor's judgment. Let me tell you, audit material is auditor's judgment. 
So it's totally the matter of professional judgment. But auditor gets this experience only over a point in time. So whether the information is material or immaterial, how well it is required, etc. In fact, if you look into the ITAF, okay, by the way, ITAF version 3 was available. Now ITAF version 4 has been released uh, two months back, two, two weeks back or one month back. You can always, this is more from an academic knowledge perspective. One can visit the ISACA website and download it. An expression of relative significance or the importance of a particular matter in the context of the whole enterprise. For example, if the company, whoever you're auditing, they have a weak controls. Okay, one control, okay. All the controls are weak, I have to evaluate from a overall idea. Okay, and let's also understand IS versus financial audit. Financial audit is focused purely on monetary terms. IS audit may or may not, may or may not be monetary or non-monetary. So it could be access controls, programs, a whole lot of these things come under IS audit. The factors to be considered, criticality of the business, cost of the operation, potential cost of errors, all of those becomes factors to be considered. A few measures to assess materiality, number of access, number of transactions, number of inquiries, nature, timing and extent, service level agreements, the cost of potential penalties, penalties for failure to comply, legal with contractual requirements. All of those things could come under audit materiality. So all of those come under audit materiality. Then comes your internal controls. So internal controls are those which are defined typically with the management. These are controls by default, they have a bearing. Okay, an example of these internal controls could be uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> periodical verification of management, periodical checks and balances, all of them can come under the internal control. And this internal control, typically the COFO, which is, you know, committee on sponsored organization by the Treadway Commission, they have defined the internal control at a high level. So they have defined internal control as a process affected by the entity's board of directors, okay? And the management designed to provide a reasonable assurance regarding the achievements of objectives. The same definition has been borrowed with some sort of a structural or, you know, high, uh, you know minor modifications in the SA 315 of our ICA. Okay, so it focuses on effectiveness and efficiency of operations. It focuses on the reliability of financial reporting. It also focuses on compliance with applicable laws and regulations. So COSO defines control activity as policies, procedures, which ensure management directives are carried out. <laughs> Okay, so this are again about COSO. You can just uh, uh, I'll probably ignore this. And these are the five components of COSO. Again, this is covered in a little in detail in your uh, chapter number five. Just give me a minute. <coughs> just having something to ensure my voice doesn't spoil too much. <coughs> yeah, so these are the 17 COSO principles bucket under the five categories, again, covered as a part of your module uh, three. So I'll not spend there too much uh, about it. Just giving you a quick over, over, um, uh, overarching summary. Control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication and monitoring activities. Yeah. Then also comes a category, ca categories of controls. Your controls are also bucket under these categories. Preventive, directive, corrective, Compensatory is not a strictly a separate control. You can still restrict it to PDC. Compensatory still is to some extent comes under any of this bucket. Based on the nature of resource, environmental, physical, logical, IS, IS management, SDLC, et cetera. Functional, based on internal accounting, operation, administrative, et cetera. Nature of IS resource, which you see over here, is what we study in chapter five, protection of IS assets. Objectives of controls, to some extent, we study. Yeah, so preventive, detective, and corrective controls, those controls which prevent you from an activity to take place, very important area of examination question, PDC controls, preventive, detective, corrective, please be very, very clear what each control means and how a technology works with reference to this control. An example could be, um, 
uh, backup. Many of them think that taking backup is a preventive control. The answer is no. Taking backup is a corrective control. Why? If you take a backup, I repeat, if you take a backup, if at all there is loss of data, you can restore it. You cannot prevent loss of data. Correct? So it is a corrective control, not a preventive control. So what is preventive? Something which avoids from taking place. Detective control, something which detects some mischief has taken place. Corrective control, something which rectifies the issue. Remember, if a corrective control has to be there, it can be there only if the detective control is there. Why? Unless I don't know what the problem is, how can I rectify it? Correct? So detective and corrective go hand in hand. Whereas preventive need not be hand in glove with detective and corrective. <clears throat> yeah. Types of internal controls. Detective. They are designed to detect the errors. Detective. Preventive, designed to keep the errors, irregularities from occurring in the first place. Corrective, designed to rectify. This is a nice chart, just to give you a perspective, how the flow of information is. If you see very carefully, the topmost pyramid, you find all the undesirable events which are sitting. This goes through those, you know, whatever the pyramids over here. If the preventive fails to catch hold of it, the detective has to catch hold of it. If the preventive fail to catch hold of it, or preventive, in fact, will not catch hold of it. Preventive will avoid it from taking place. Some unwanted fellow comes, security guard shows up. Unwanted fellow comes, security guard was not available, or he beat the security guard and he still entered. Preventive failed, or preventive was successful, or whatever issue. But detective has to catch hold of him. The detective also fails. Corrective should eat. Now, very difficult for a corrective action to be taking post because a corrective can work only if a detective is okay. Yeah, this is one more important question or slide where your implementation of internal controls can be of use. <clears throat> Your internal controls can be implemented under these three buckets, admin, logical, physical. When I use the word admin, we are referring to policies, procedures. When I'm referring to technological or logical, I'm using software, tools, passwords, etc. When I say physical, I'm talking about guards, lock, rooms, physical substance. Why is this relevant? Your internal control can be implemented under any of these three sections which you notice over here. Very, very important. And the beauty is, an uh, internal control, which is in the nature of preventive, detective, or corrective, can fall in any of these buckets. An internal control can fall in any of these buckets. And how do I know that? There's a classical example. This one slide itself is a 100% short shot examination question. Why? They can pick and choose whatever they want in this particular slide. They can ask you, which of the following is an admin control which is preventive in nature? They can give hundreds of options, and I mean, three options, sorry, uh, uh, three options from this, so many options over here, and one option will come from here. So understand this. Anything which is administrative oriented will come here. What is administration oriented? Somebody has to be there to enforce, look, do. Policy, somebody has to make it. Training, somebody has to do it. Audit log review. I never said audit log. I said audit log review. Somebody has to review the audit log. Corrective, uh, sorry, uh, uh, incident response plan, business, all these things are plans. Then you have technical. Centrally managed data protection. Then you have what is called as uh, uh, centrally managed log server, intrusion. All these things are using some sort of a technology. Last is your physical. What you can actually see, data center, video recording, the response of the team, all these people are physical. Now, if you see from this category, you have preventive, detective, and corrective. A combination of this, my dear friends, is an examination question. I'm repeatedly telling you. So 
Okay, I'm not going to these activities. Yeah, internal control components. General control plus IT controls this internal control. General control may or may not be relevant at all. A watchman or a security guard is not just for your IT resources, it's for your entire organization. So that could be an example of a general control. General plus IT, let's say if you have to access your organization, you have a smart card or you have to use your fingerprint biometric swipe, only then you can enter an IT control. In fact, many of the many of the offices today, the biometric has been disabled. Why? Because of the COVID situation where accidentally somebody's touch could have an impact. Correct? Because that biometric, everybody touches. There's obviously an impact. Correct? We don't know who's, you know, unfortunately having this sort of a, a symptom. So therefore, what they have done, they have only enabled everybody to use their ID card without that touch. You know, you have the device, they bring the ID card close to it and they just pay off. So it's more like a touchless because of the RFID technology which works. In that case, what happens? Your inherent risk is increasing. What if some other employee who was wearing a helmet did not even show his ID card, but just swiped and he entered? Correct? So this is where you need to understand the risk. So general risk, IT risk, both of them put together as your internal control. Your IS controls can be further divided into IT application specific controls and IT general controls. IT application specific controls, IT general controls. This IT application controls is what you study in chapter six. So I'm not touching that now. IT general controls, you'll be studying in this chapter a little bit, chapter four a little bit. Okay, so therefore we'll get an overall idea. So what is this IS audit function? So it should be placed so as to ensure, or where should this IS audit function be? It should be placed in such a manner that the independence should be you know, taken care of, objectivity and independence. The composition, the constitution should be ideally decided by the audit committee, very important. And here one very important wording is called IS audit charter. The audit charter is the high level structure which defines the roles and responsibilities and it should be approved by the audit committee. Or in case when there is a no audit committee, the highest level of management which has an independence. Okay, so it should be able to discharge the roles and responsibilities and for that they should be giving them the adequate resources. So what are the typical levels of assurance which is given? I mean, this is just a perspective. Positive assurance saying that, okay, everything looks fine. Limited or negative assurance, uh, normally we call it as review. We don't call it as audit. Or sometimes there's no assurance, you know, such as agreed upon procedure, which we perform. So if you look into uh, assurance and attestation services, where we have a larger set of assurance services, Whereas audit and reviews comes under att att attestation services. Okay. Whereas just a general assurance could be, you know, just some sort of a proofread where we are not doing an audit or a review. Whereas non-assurance, you can have management consulting, bookkeeping, tax services, implementation of controls in case of IS auditor. All these things comes under this bucket. Okay. So I'm ignoring the practice questions because these are all available in which case in your, uh, uh, what do you call them? Material. Okay. Uh, let me quickly take you to an overview of ITAF. ITAF third edition is what is applicable in your syllabus. ITAF fourth edition was just released by ISACA uh, two to three weeks back, but it is not there in your syllabus. So you need not worry about it. But this is what is the scope which you have to be aware of. So what is ITAF? It's basically an assurance framework. See, in simple language, it is standards of art. If you ask me in a layman's language, it's standards of auditing. Since ISACA is the body which is popularly known for systems audit, they had to come up with an assurance framework. And what is that item? That's all. ICA forms it. We call it as standards of auditing. International Accounting Standard Board follows it. International Standards on Audit or International Auditing Standards. US follows it. They call it as SSAE, Statements and Standards and Assurance Engagement, etc. That is if ISACA forms it, it's called ITAF, that's all. But the beauty is, this is only focused from information technology. Whereas others could be general audit, 
because the focus here is only of IT audit. We as well, we make a reference to ITF. So ISACA is an international association focused on IT governance. We'll not spend too much time into this. So what is an ITF? It's a comprehensive good practice practice setting reference model. So what all does it take care? Establishes the standards, defines the terms, provides some sort of a guidance to tools, techniques, planning, and design. To whom does ITF apply? Whoever is acting as an IS auditor, they're expected to go use that. It's a good guidance. For all ISACA members, ITF by default applies. For the rest of them, it is voluntary, but it's a good set of bench practice, benchmark practices. Engaged in providing assurance over IT audit, application, infrastructure, etc. And they have standards, guidelines, and tools. The beauty thing is they have three things, standards, guidelines, and tools. So these three things can be used for a wider audience, including whatever uh, requirements are. Yeah, these standards are mandatory. Again, as I told you, to be used by ISACA members or you know those who are using this. But for non-ISACA members, it's more suggested because you cannot say Indian auditor has to use a foreign standard. Correct? It is not mandatory. Unless you are doing an engagement under those requirements. Why do I use? You can use it for any IS audit assessment. Uh, you can focus on financial audit, operational audit. Now they have not made it very, very, uh, they have not designed it to address specific requirements. Okay? So wherever assurance is there, you can use ITAP. And there's a bifurcation, general standards. This general standards is nothing but in simple layman's wording, it is nothing but your, I, uh, what is that, SA 200 and the basic requirements. What is your independence? What is ethics? What is that? All of them covered. Then you have your performance standard. Now performance standard all deal with how you should be doing the work. Planning, supervision, scoping. Third comes the reporting. How are you supposed to be the, do the reporting? Address the reports, types of report, communication, all of this gets covered in the reporting. And last is guidelines. The guidelines provide the direction, how you should be focusing on these items. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the standards, <laughs> 101, 102, whatever you see here, these are general performance and reporting. So you need not go through these standards in detail, just to be aware what these are. Whether they can ask you which number is what, I don't think so, because here the focus is not to test your knowledge or your memory part, but maybe to some extent, uh, they may also, one, one question as a bouncer may come, just be aware of it. Yeah, so then you have your guidelines. This talks about general guidelines, the 2000 series. Then you have performance guidelines, which is 2200 series. Reporting guidelines, 2400 series. And the tools and techniques, which is the 3000 series. Various methodologies, tools, how to use CAD tools. You know, they have a publication on SAP. They have a publication in ERM. Likewise, our own ICA helps us publication. How you can use CAD tools, how to audit IT environment. A lot of publications are there. Okay, and again, here you can see a lot of guidelines. This is with <coughs> the reference to the previous item. Okay, anyways, I'm not going to discuss ITAF here, but I hope that you got a clarity. Next, audit charter. I think I made a mention about this. Once again, I'm repeating, audit charter is a very important thing. It's a document approved by those in charge with governance, which is normally the audit committee where, or the board of directors. If you find both the options, audit committee will be a better answer. That defines the purpose, authority, and responsibility of what? Of the internal audit activity. So the audit will base, the charter will say, establish the function of an internal audit. So it defines this one. It authorizes people to access all records. Otherwise, somebody comes from internal audit, he'll ask, who, who are you to ask my department details? Correct? So you, the authority comes from the charter. Because, see, any department should get some authority. So that this document we call it as a chart. It defines the scope, audit functions, etc. So key aspects of audit charter, authority, purpose, responsibilities are defined. Independence and accountability is defined. It also speaks about roles and responsibilities during this audit engagement. Okay, professional standards that IS audit assurance professional is expected to go through. So if you look into independence, it is covered in IT, ITAF, 1002, 103 guidelines, etc. So they simply use the word freedom from conditions that threaten the objectivity. Simple. Freedom from conditions that threaten the objectivity. Objectivity is what? Uh, you know, 
uh, being independent anything which independent compromises your independent that basically is what uh, we are looking at okay such threats must be managed by the individual auditor engagement function or at the organization the threat could be to the audit partner the threat could be for the audit firm the threat could be to the person who is auditing okay so what is this independence it says independence in appearance independence of mind what is appearance a third party should know that you and that fellow are independent say by the name itself is clearly evident okay this fellow uh, company is uh, you know owned by brother another brother is auditing it correct gone independence of mind it is not just by relationship or third party it is also by mind you may be auditing your friend's entity totally unrelated but because of certain other reasons you whatever you say you are saying okay there is a compromise of independence so independence to be ensured again for professional for the organization as well as for the function all the three layers okay examination question what are the non audit services that are considered to be impairing independence examination last question which are those activities an is auditor cannot perform first assuming management responsibilities any management responsibility if you assume auditor cannot be or you cannot do the audit second material involvement in supervision performing designing developing testing installing configuration wherever you find the word implementation auditor can never do that or if it is implementation he cannot do audit it is mutually exclusive either you do implementation or you do audit you can't do both designing the controls for information system that are material designing the controls which are material you cannot do that providing advice that forms a primary basis for management decision you are the sole advisor and based on your decision only they are to make it all these four are classical examples four options of course all the four are right options over here in examination one of the options they can replace and say which of the following an is auditor can perform or three random things and this could be a fourth option which of the following an is auditor cannot perform an example this is a beautiful example this is a beautiful very practical insight your in fact your threats are of divided into five categories if you read your icai code of ethics the latest code of ethics 2020 which is implemented i think 19 implemented in 20 i'm not sure which effective from 1st of july you'll find the types of threat under these five categories self interest threat a threat you know you are interested you are the auditor your relative family member your son child spouse is working in the client interest in the client concern about losing the client if you are an employee you are taken loan therefore you don't want to be independent whatever your employer says you are okay incentive compensation self review error discovery involving reporting designing auditor being the past director all these are concerned as an employee you are taking a decision and that has been subject to subsequent justification example you were a part of accounting team last year and next year you are part of internal audit and as an internal auditor you have to justify what you only did so you will obviously justify so it's a compromise of independence advocacy you are rendering other services to the client or you know as an employee seeking salary hike so you are somewhat dependent on them you are advocating what that other person say familiarity you have a very family relationship or significant influence or you know some sort of a political whatever it is there is a significant influence or is an employee long association he says you have been my employee for 30 years you can't do the small fraud independence helping family members gain employment all these things intimidation threatening gun point you know if you do it others will reduce your audit fees litigation all those things as concern as an employee threat of dismissal dominant person influencing so all these things are cases of which has a threat to independence now i was reading a recent uh, report one of these big four companies was an auditor for one of these large companies a large brand i don't know whether they are listed or unlisted for 134 years i said 134 years same auditor i mean whether they did right wrong i am not questioning i'm only saying that this is obviously one area which people will think about that is why in ica the uh, sorry the companies act has brought in that audit rotation mandatory etc 
Now, next, what is the reasonable expectation? Okay, so your opinion is basically what we are discussing. So engagement can be complete. Scope should be enabled drawing a conclusion. And you should try to do your entire work within a reasonable time frame. So your opinion can be four types. Unqualified. Sab kuch hai. No exception, no significant deficiencies. Please note, uh, we say material misstatement in case of financial. In case of IS audit, we say uh, deficiency. Why? Deficiency is a term associated with controls. Deficiency is a term associated with controls. A material misstatement is associated with a larger process in financial exam. Okay. So unqualified, no exception, no significant deficiency. If it is qualified, there are exceptions to no significant deficiency. That means everything is okay except one or two. Therefore, you are saying no material weakness. But adverse. You're saying one or more significant deficiency is existing. Therefore, there is a material weakness. And disclaimer, I am not able to take an opinion or I'm not able to make an opinion. Something is not within my control. He's not providing me this data, etc. Disclaimer. Common assertions, which we know this, I'm not touching confidentiality, completeness, accuracy, integrity, availability, compliance. Please keep in mind, all of this should be from an angle of IT, not from a financial. Okay, so that is basically what this particular uh, section covers. Uh, in the meanwhile, I, um, just give me a minute. Let me also uh, go to the next part of it, which is the phases of IS audit. Let me quickly swap my screen. Just give me a minute. Yeah. So the last section is the phases of IS audit because the second part we focus more on ITAF. The last part is your information system assurance services, where we look into the phases of audit. We'll have a step-by-step -step discussion on what are the various phases so so that we quickly sort of you know have a bird's eye view on what exactly happens so that we get a thought process out. okay here one of the examination question is a concept called as a control self-assessment now control self-assessment is nothing but a management technique which assures you know any stakeholder that the internal control systems is reliable in other words i am asking the management itself to do an audit but it is not done by independent internal audit team, but done by the same person who is responsible for it. Look at the second line. It is done by the assessment is done by assessment of internal controls made by the staff and management of the units involved, which means if I'm the cashier, the management will ask me, what are the weaknesses you notice as a cashier? Correct. So it is a self-evaluation, evaluation done by the control owners itself, and it forms part of the first line of defense. Okay, CSA is a tool which can be a simple questionnaire, it can be a workshop, whatever method, but you ask them themselves what is the internal weakness. You might be thinking, sir, why will somebody you know use that? So you can use various methods, questionnaire, workshop, management meetings, etc. But you can always ask, sir, is this going to be relevant? or who is going to be asking this. That is always a 100% question uh, because you never know how, what, when can things can happen. So it always becomes a area of question mark. Just give me a minute. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, control self assessment, a few benefits early detection of risk. You can improvise and you can identify internal controls much quicker. You can uh, reduce the controls. Overall compliance costs can come down, etc. Limitation is uh, many of them think it's an additional workload. Existing work only, they don't have time to do. You ask them to do one more thing, difficult. Next, what is the guarantee that they will disclose all the issues, all the errors, all the problems? No guarantee. And generally, the tendency is everybody will say, sir, my process, everything is fine. Well, if he says there's a problem in his process, management will say, okay, very good, you only fix it. Correct? So all these things are actually challenges. Okay? Yeah. Uh, next is your audit report uh, in a gist. 
not a summary it's more of a just at a high level so you plan you execute and report in plan you understand the environment risk assessment you do in execution you do the sample testing documentation there is a very important examination questions are asked here and then of course you have your audit evidence report is audit report and recommendations follow up review all of those comes under this reporting structure so planning first and foremost set up the audit objective understand the audit objective be very very clear audit objective either given by statute or you have to clearly write in your engagement letter and clearly mention what is out of scope otherwise it is a challenge it should be with reference to audit charger uh, or audit charter sorry uh, terms of engagement audit scope audit planning what are the objectives of is controls so based upon all of this you decide what your audit objectives is and of course sometimes rfp is used a request for proposal many circumstances they ask only for goods but sometimes it is used for services also they may request an rfp we have to give a detailed proposal so in rfp what is there you give the background of the proposed activity who are the potential bidders you may also contain a key summary you know which other sections of the document just a gist and then you have to mention clearly the requirements about the organization please note here request for proposal has to be made by the management auditor need not do however in certain circumstances auditor is an advisor for as an is auditor you may also be doing an advisory role in that case you may be asked to draft an rfp in that case you will not be doing the audit correct you may be asked to do an rfp okay so specify the requirement of organization specify the detailed information size of the organization who has to do audit the technical specification so you can understand rfp like a tender document which has so many details what is the selection criteria what should be the delivery by time what is the milestones whether you have to give some guarantee financial guarantee all of those things comes in touch you also speak about timelines within when you need to submit the manner in which you have to submit what is the process you know you can draw a flow chart or you can mention this thing some of these rfps you know they have two tenders commercial tender uh, sorry financial or commercial tender uh, operational tender or something everything other than commercial will appear in one document commercial will appear in another so first they will have evaluate the other than commercial if that guy is fit enough then only they'll open commercial otherwise they'll not open okay so that's another one thing otherwise what will happen directly if they go based on financial whoever is cheapest is allotted so first they will assess the quality of the quality of that fellow then they'll open the financial request for references may be given sometimes you have to attach engagement letter sometimes you have to attach documents etc these rfps are normally formed followed in all these statutory organizations government organizations banks where procedure driven they have a set of process a uh, small tweak around this followed in uh, private sector entities next comes your point of contact in case you have any queries audit charter defines the purpose responsibility authority and accountability of is audit and assurance function very important it defines all of these things so this itself is an mcq question look at the wordings that itself is an mcq question. which of the following is defined in an audit charter purpose responsibility authority accountability some words they can use interchange so be very clear is auditor to consider this guideline when determining how to implement the standard use professional judgment etc okay audit the charter clearly addresses the purpose responsibility authority and accountability and it also speaks about purpose roles mission objective goals etc what is the meaning of what is the meaning of responsibility operating principles independence relationship etc authority who can have access right to give the access functions to be audited audit expectations all of them come with accountability who is he reportable to who is he going to report what is his rights and responsibilities benchmarks you know all these things are defined then you have obviously your engagement letter your it has to be clearly mention what is your scope objective independence risk assessment procedure specific audit requirements if you have anything and deliverables an audit engagement letter is the responsibility of the auditor not the client engagement letter is issued by the auditor very rare situations the company says we have a standard engagement letter you follow that normally client audit has to give that okay communication with audit Uh, which is nothing but our client describe the services provide the cost estimate describe the problem you know all these are general gap then comes engagement planning you need to understand what is the scope timeline and deliverables compliance with applicable laws and professional auditing standards very important you need to follow a risk based audit approach we already discussed in the previous section engagement specific issues any issues specific to this engagement a b and c 
whatever issues documentation and reporting required so all of this have to be considered when you're planning the engagement what are the documentation uh, whatever important things milestones etc you put it into a plan and all changes should go through a change management procedure samples uh, these are samples and is i'm not going to show you the samples out there but yeah phase two what is the objective of is audit at a high level you can say these are could be the objectives fiduciary more from a trust angle you know reliability whether you are compliant with these things etc those are from a fiduciary angle. then comes from a quality angle what is quality efficiency effectiveness from a security angle cia confidentiality integrity and availability so there is again details about each of them i am not spending too much time here i'll give you this this is any is from the presentation or icm material yeah uh, in integrity please ensure we have something called authenticity you know the able to verify the content in a authenticated manner non repudiation and accountability so you are if some action has happened you should not be in a position to undo it or it should not it should not be that you know action of the user cannot be verified it is a verifiable means okay so these are things which you have to take care availability i think most of us are okay uh, this is just a general uh, yeah next understanding the information preliminary knowledge of the industry of the of the entity is necessary nature of management regulatory environment and operation let's say you are doing an audit in a of a company in let us say somewhere in dubai so obviously you need to understand what the business is who their shareholders is probably dubai may not have private limited company they may have some other name they may have llc i don't know i'm just giving examples yeah then regulatory environment what is the law over there what is the operations so all those things should i sorry to show then he should also understand the industry factors market competitors what is the technology they're using are they using cloud are they using a native application web hosted how are they using vpn connection what are the key business risks example in auditing pharma industry i said pharma industry of late cyber attacks have increased so you should have an understanding of all of this then understand the organization structure focus on the task allocation understand the audit objective so you know if you look into big bazaar the organization structure is different flipkart the organization structure is different correct responsibility segregation of duties sop standard operating procedures all of these you have to spend some time to understand understand the it infrastructure ola versus mintra versus flipkart or big bazaar each of them have a different architecture correct uh, how they are structured you know they normally it architecture if you ask them they'll give you a diagram you know, how the network is how what speaks to what so that's a very nice diagram you can probably google search you will get some sample diagrams also look into the age of hardware software uh, licensing requirements third party vendor requirements all of this comes under it infrastructure yeah and not to forget the regulatory regulatory and standards you have the sa 250 which talks about consideration of laws and requirements so in india any company you are doing an audit in addition to the income tax act companies act from a information technology angle you should also look into the information technology act especially section 43 and 43a which we will be discussing in the next few slides section 3 a few just we will just spend some time section 3 talks about authentication of electronic record how can i authenticate an electronic record they say an electronic record can be authenticated if it is by method of asymmetric crypto system and hash function two important words important slide understand the concept asymmetric crypto system symmetric and asymmetric we already understood in the previous chapter symmetric same key to lock same key to unlock asymmetric key one key to lock another key to unlock what is a crypto system encryption so that means we should follow an asymmetric crypto system like a digital signature and which should have a hash function now what is the hash function i'll put it in a very very simple language you are giving two inputs the system is running a hash calculation on this mathematical operation some mathematical operation and it generated an output that output is called hash result this output is such that every time you give the same input same output will come 2 into 3 or 3 into 2 always it will come 6 but from 6 you should not be able to identify 2 or you should not be able to identify 3 in other words a hash function means an algorithmic mapping where you get a hash results based on the input files such that every time on this input file 
you run the hash algorithmic function, you get the same output. From the output, you don't get to know what the input is. Are you clear? So that it is computationally infeasible to reverse work. Section seven talks about documentation in electronic form. They say if any law says that you need to have the documents in physical form, if you have in electronic form, it is okay. As long as it is accessible and the re original form as much as possible is retained. Okay, say you saved it in 2003 Microsoft Word. Today we are talking about Office 365 or Windows 2010, whatever. It should be compatible. That's all they're saying. 43A, very, very important. It is a liability on the company, a body corporate, partnership firm, private limited, sole property, anybody who deals with sensitive personal data. In India today, this is the privacy law. As we speak now, this is the only privacy law in India. Okay, A section okay, which talks about any person dealing with sensitive private personal data or information and is negligent in implementing reasonable security practices as a result of which somebody else is having a loss, then this organization has to pay compensation. In the example of our uh, Big Basket, which I told you, Big Basket reason recently had some sort of a data breach. They were handling personal information. They had a data breach. Even though they maintained, if they were able to demonstrate that they were able to maintain reasonable security practices, great. But if they were not able to main, maintain the reasonable security practices, correct? Then somebody can take action against them and say, boss, something went wrong. Section 72, capital A, talks about imprisonment uh, or a fine or a penalty if you know some sort of information breach has taken place. The Sarbanese Oxley Act of US, Section 404, tests the internal controls over financial reporting. In India, it is tested in the form of um, SA, um, what is this? Uh, um, section 139. 139 and 143 to be very specific. You have the PCOB standards, again, not relevant as such. The guidance on ICOFAR, internal controls over financial reporting, there they make a mention, specific mention on general IT controls. These are policies, procedures that may apply, uh, uh, the, that apply to applications to support the effective functioning of application controls. So they apply to mainframe, mini frame, end user, whatever environment. And broadly they can apply to data center, network operations, system acquisition, change and maintenance, program change, access security, application system development. So if you see very broadly, each of them is covered in your DISA service. Application system maintenance is chapter five. Access security is chapter uh, four. Program change comes in your chapter four. All these things comes in your chapter four. There is some portion overlapping here and there. Okay, so this is your general IT controls which focus on the overall hierarchy. Let me tell you, general IT controls are those controls which are used to access your operating system, network, or database. Example, um, you have to log into your office only with your ID card to physically enter. Only when you physically enter, you can touch any of the systems, general control. You have to log in with a username password. And you have only one username password powered by single sign-on technology, where one place, if I disable, all the access will be disabled. Okay, in all those cases, it comes under general IT controls. Yeah, then you have the listing agreement, clause 14. of course, this is overwritten by today, what we call it as uh, uh, LODR regulations, I think, listing obligation disclosure requirement regulations. Uh, clause 14 requires uh, similar provision is that review by audit committee, Intel audit reports, internal weaknesses, you know, appointment of auditor, all these things are covered. And then you have your ISO 27001 family, which is considered to be uh, the best uh, set of practices for information security management services. There's a whole bucket of ISOs which are available, not that new syllabus, just to be aware, ISO 27001 talks about information security management standard. Then you have ITAF, I think we spoke about. We have COBIT. Again, we are going to cover this in the next chapter. I'm not touching this. Um, then when you're doing risk assessment, these are a few factors which you have to consider. You review the IT principles, policies, uh, look into the risk function specific to the detailed activities. It could be the way risk is captured, risk register, uh, observe the culture, organization behavior. Because many a times what happens 
when you speak with the people only you understand ah sir this is not applicable this is not applicable so that means that they are not really bothered about formal risk assessment you can make your opinion privately okay then we have it general controls i told you controls that are not specific to any application but exist in the environment a uh, simple example wifi password could be it general control. Uh, if you have to connect with the network, you have to enter a password, user ID password. That's an ID general control. So design as an environment as a whole, okay, and not business in a specific business context. Impl implemented and maintained to ensure the overall hygiene of your infrastructure. Remember, you need to always do an IT control review because if the IT control, IT general control review itself is a failure, what is the use of having an application? You may have the safest of the application. But that application you gave it in the hands of a monkey, it really doesn't serve the purpose, correct? So that is where you need to be very, very cautious. So IT general control versus the application. Yeah, what you see here are the various types of general controls, operating system controls, management controls, financial controls, data management, organization structure, data processing, physical access, all of them covered under your IT general controls. So operating system controls is whether your operating system is regularly updated, patches are updated. What is the meaning of a patch? Patch is nothing but the latest release of your operating system. Management controls. Who has access to what? Is How is the employee giving access? General procedure. Financial controls. Okay, is there a segregation of duties? Anything more than 3 lakh rupees or 5 lakh rupees, 2-3 levels of approval, etc. Data management controls, controls which are, you know, how the data should be managed on a regular basis. Who should take the data backup? Is the data checked for restoration? All those things are general controls. Organization structure controls. If tomorrow something is a problem, who is reporting to whom? Okay, I am continuously reporting there is a problem. My supervisor is not even bothered. So is there an escalation mechanism? Is there a whistleblower policy? How am I processing the data? Next, who has the access to physical data? So all of these are types of general controls. <clears throat> yeah, so these are all few ty other types of general controls. Logical access, who has access to what resources? You know, for example, it could be um, uh, who has access to uh, a database? who has access to um, firewall logs, et cetera. System development controls. How or what is the process of developing the system? Who can develop the system? How it is to be developed, et cetera, et cetera. That comes under system development. Then your business continuity. Tomorrow, if something goes wrong, is my business having a DCP, DR, DCP plan, DR plan? Tomorrow, how can I continue my business? Can I work from home, et cetera. System maintenance. Is there a periodical maintenance? Who's taking care of it? Can there be a question where the fellow who comes for maintenance, he disables something and he disappears, I don't check. Computer security center, who manages the overall security? Is there a CISO certified, sorry, uh, chief information system officer? Internet and intranet controls, how is the internet monitored? Is there somebody who's regularly monitoring, blocking, firewall, intranet? Personal computer, in the computer, can anybody install any software they feel like? You know, if you go to my computers or if you go to control panel, you'll see so many people having so many softwares. Whereas this is permitted, is it authorized? Audit trails, who has a capture of this audit trails? What is a trail? Trail is like a log. Just like your CCTV camera. What does CCTV camera do? Who came in, who went out, it'll capture. Audit trail also the same thing. What was the IP which came in? What is the IP which went out? It'll capture this information. <coughs> then you have your IT application controls. <laughs> your IT application controls are specific to a particular com com uh, computer, uh, sorry, particular specific to a particular application. It could be something relating to, let us say, um, Tally, SAP. Uh, it could be something specific to XYZ software, very specific to that. For example, in Tally, debit and credit should match. Otherwise, you don't pass the entry. Correct? So A and B should match. So like that, there are a lot of checks and balances. So that could be your application controls. Okay. What is it in the previous slide? What is the difference between personal control and operating system control? Please understand. Personal, con personal computer controls are controls at a PC level, which is both combination of software and hardware. Combination of both software and hardware. Whereas your 
operating system controls are specific only to an operating system. How the operating system is configured, who can access what, how it is being designed, etc. So personal computer controls can also include operating system controls, but personal computer controls a little more. Even your physical access controls all comes under personal computer controls. Then next is your input controls. Okay, so this part, whatever you see here, I will be skipping now because we will be touching it in chapter number six, which is your, uh, uh, what is that, uh, business application audit. So there are a few slides which I'll be skipping over here, you know, which is covered there in detail. So please excuse me. <clears throat> All these sections, we will be covering it in your application controls because today's chapter, I want to focus only on the initial part of it. Okay. So I'm just skipping these slides. We'll cover that a little later. Don't worry. So then comes your methods of audit sampling. Yeah, all your edit output controls, everything comes as that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just give me a minute. Yeah, I think this is covered as part of this chapter, risk control matrix. I think we spoke about it. It's a matrix which speaks about risk and the controls in place. Uh, it normally is used as a spreadsheet. You can maintain it for process like purchase, sales, etc., Or you can maintain for each application. You know, all of these are possible. Then each spreadsheet would contain the following columns. Risk, what is the description of the risk? What is the control objective? What is the control number just for identification? What is the control in present? Okay. For example, every time a person has to require access, approval from supervisor is necessary. That is a control. Right. So, and it's typically RCM may also be used as an audit notebook, which contains a lot of these information like audit observations, testing plan, etc. If you visit our ICI website and download the guidance note on internal controls over financial reporting, you'll get one zip file. In that zip file, you'll also get one Excel format, which talks about RC, uh, risk control matrix, a very simple and a beautifully designed document. Okay, uh, next quickly, I will jump and look into methods of audit sampling, very important examination question. 100% one question expect on audit sampling. Now here you have statistical sampling, which includes random sampling and systematic sampling. Okay, I repeat, statistical sampling, random sampling, systematic sampling. Random, why is it called statistical? Because you use law of random numbers to identify. And systematic sampling, every fifth, every third, every ninth, so therefore sampling. Non-statistical sampling, which is haphazard, whatever you feel like you do, judgmental sampling, all of those are non-statistical. This one slide, 100% examination question. Attribute sampling, variable sampling. Attribute sampling is always used for compliance testing. Whereas variable sampling is used for substantive testing. I repeat, attribute sampling is used for compliance testing. Variable sampling is used for substantive testing. Okay. So when I use attribute for compliance testing, there's a presence of an attribute. You check whether that compliance is completed or not, whether the compliance is taken care of. In a variable sampling, you check the entire characteristics of the population based upon the value or the risk and therefore for substantive it is useful. Easy blind method to remember, alphabet A and C are close by, alphabet V and S are close by. So attribute sampling, compliance testing. Variable sampling, substantive testing. I hope that's clear. Okay. Next, within attribute sampling, you have multiple methods. Remember what I told you, attribute sampling is used for compliance system. So fixed sampling, rate occurrence in a population. Example, approvals in signature forms, you can use a fixed sampling. Every fifth, third, fourth, fifth. Stop and go sampling. Here, what you do, you prevent excess sampling and stop the audit testing. So you check if three, four population is 
compliant you feel it's okay for example every document you find that there is a seal of managing director approval etc you feel that okay few policies if i check it's enough i do not go through the the entire sample so that's called stop and go sampling when less errors are found you use this method third is discovery sampling discovery sampling is when the expected occurrence is very very low i repeat when the expected occurrence is very very low then you call it as discovery sampling it is normally used in case of discovery frauds irregularities etc so until you discover you keep on searching okay so your sampling itself is a very weird one so these are the types of attribute sampling then you have variable sampling in variable you have what is called stratified sampling stratified is you create them based on groups common features for example all invoices between 10 rupees to 500 rupees All invoices between five not one to nine hundred one. So all those things are stratified sampling. Population is divided into groups. Then you have unstratified. Unstratified is anything. Average represents total. You just do a pro rata basis. Then is a different estimation used to estimate the total difference between audited values and unaudited values. For example, you know overall population is five hundred, of which how much you audited is this much. how much you didn't audit is balanced so is there some ratio which you can establish so from the sample you determine okay this is how the population is okay so that is it. then of course you have analytical procedures these are nothing but substantial tests for doing detailed uh, implementation compliance testing we know with us the controls okay so these are again a basic yarn about what is compliance what is uh, these things yeah this is one nice uh, yeah examples of compliance testing very very important examination as question which of the following are examples of compliance testing user access rights if you review the access user access right what are you doing you are checking whether that person is compliant or not so compliance test program change control process anything which you check whether it is followed a policy sop defined that becomes a compliance testing so user access right program documentation follow up review logs software license audit all of them you are checking the compliance what is the difference between compliance testing and substantive testing are controls in place consistently that is compliance access control program procedure etc what is substantive testing are transactions processed accurately is the data entered correct is there some sort of a double checking validation calculation error error or checking operational documentation all of this comes under substantive testing So evidence is gathered to evaluate the integrity to check whether the transaction is actually taken place in the right spot. Example: uh, checking accuracy, validity of the data, uh, performance of a complex calculation, say savings bank interest calculation. So it is calculated four percent. You re-perform it. So that's a substantive testing. You are going to the details. Okay. Whereas whether savings bank interest is appearing on every last day of the quarter, that is compliance testing. okay then of course you have design effectiveness you check whether the building structure is fine or the control structure is fine if the building structure or the control design itself is a failure the entire purpose is defeated so testing of design effectiveness testing of operating effectiveness performed by is auditor is on a every identified control so what does it involve it's basically blueprint it's like more like an architect view of the diagram so you understand how it is and remember for assessing the effectiveness of design you always do a walk through i repeat you always do a walk through next comes your operational effectiveness operational effectiveness is you go to the details whether the transaction details is it accurate appearing accurate or not whether these information in their transactions is it accurate whether the transactions are effectively taking place what is the efficienciness all of those comes in your operational effectiveness then of course you have your audit evidence auditor's judgment of the evidence only thing in an it audit please remember your evidence can be digital your evidence can be uh, you know in excel spreadsheets your evidence can be in digital copies which you should be taken uh, i should be done probably in another few more minutes i have about uh, 10 10 to 15 odd slides i should be able to wrap it up before that Yeah, then comes your gathering audit evidence sa 500 it talks about all these measurements you know physical examination confirmation documentation recalculation all of these are audit evidence gathering methods 
So types of audit evidence, a few examples which you can see a screenshot, photograph, emails. Uh, please remember email with timestamp because uh, otherwise if somebody sends you the email in that time is changed, one. Memory dump, log dump, IS policies, external confirmation, all of these are e e example of evidences. You know, there's a carefully planned fraud where somebody actually, you know, has gone and modified this amount. So where it was mentioned as one lakh, okay, one was mentioned, the word one was replaced by four. Okay, if you look at it carefully, this is one, O-N-A. That fellow just wrote the word F. Okay, and here that four, he just made it as this. So you have to be very, very careful when you are sort of writing this because one and four looks same here. If you look, if you remove this F, it looks like one. So you have to be very careful when you're going to the details. Evidence preservation, you'll have to ensure that evidence are preserved. Uh, you copy the images, you take an extract. Sometimes, sometimes evidences are not given. In that case, we make a documentation saying that I reviewed these things and I found them to be satisfactory. I write it down. Sometimes it is possible because of sensitivity, they will not give, or, or allow you to take the evidence. Okay. And you need to preserve the chain of custody. What is chain of custody? The entire flow from how you got the information, the emails which you send, and then how you got those responses. Sometimes you've got it through an external drive. You mentioned I received it through external drive. Because tomorrow when some issue happens or when there's a forensics involved, the chain of custody becomes very important. Okay, so these are general documentation guidelines. I'm not spending too much time into this. What are the general things you need to mention? Your documentation is what you have spoken. What is audit procedure, audit finding, interpretation, audit report issued, etc. Sometimes you may also use the work of external auditors, external audit experts, uh, insurance experts, surveyors, etc. So you can use the work of an expert to understand the impact of IS audit, professional liability, what is the objectivity, uh, professional competence of the or other auditor to be looked into, supervisory audit management control. So these are all the areas where you can probably use a work of an expert. And the last phase is reporting. So reporting, you focus on the evidence gathered. You should assess the strength and weakness of each of them. And normally a control matrix is often utilized to assess the proper level of controls. So you also do what is called as a risk ranking method. A matrix is used to fill the appropriate measurements. When completed, the matrix will be prepared to highlight what are the areas of issues. So these are example, green areas, these are low risk. Orange areas, you know, they are moderate risk. Red areas, these are high risk. Again, you need to define. It is not just enough if you write green, orange, and red. You need to clearly mention it. And re remember, whenever you are mentioning a report, please mention the executive summary. And once you mention the executive summary, it just gives us just visual, some graphics, some image. And this, this is what has happened. Then go into the details. You can give the detailed content, detailed observation, recommendation, implication, all of those you can give it. And normally it is given in Word document. Sometimes it's also supplemented with an Excel sheet so that they have an easy way to cross refer. Implementation of recommendation. Auditor is, uh, you know, if uh, the controls are not effective or the auditor should have a follow-up program to sort of, you know, verify that. Sometimes follow-up may not come within the scope of audit, but you have to take care of that. Okay. So that is about this particular section. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I will be happy to address. Let me just stop sharing for the time being.